Good morning, and welcome to uh, worship at St. Andrew's Church. You know that, but maybe the people uh, joining us in the distance don't know where they are, but uh, we're wel welcome to St. Andrew's Church, Niagara the Lake. Um, I don't keep tabs too much on who is uh, joining us for worship uh, at a distance, but I know some people um, I've discovered my sister in Ireland, but she's got a whole group of people <laughs> who join us. So the Irish, you're doubly welcome. And uh, we're glad to have you. And on this Canada Day, or at least the day after Canada Day, but we're celebrating that this morning. So lovely to have you all here. And some of you in your red and white finery. I'm very pleased about that. I, was, I said to someone coming in, I'm not wearing anything red, but by the time I finish preaching, my face will be red. So I'll be part of the uh, season. So. Uh, we are here to worship God and we pray God will bless us as we do so. Everyone's invited for the coffee hour after church in the Kirk Hall. The announcements are printed for you. There's nothing uh, out of the ordinary this week, I don't think. There's one that's missing there, however. On Thursday at 2 p.m., the caregivers group will be back. So that's Thursday at 2 p.m., the caregivers group. And I think that's all we've got to announce today. That's short and sweet. So let's take a moment to prepare for entering into God's presence. God calls us to worship these words, famous words from Psalm 95. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Let us worship God. <laughs>
coming into church that they thought in the last few weeks the singing had improved at St Andrews <laughs> after I preached something about singing. Well, I hope that's true, but uh, that sounded good, and I liked the desk camp very much. So let's come with our prayer of adoration and confession. Almighty God, Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of all time, past, present, and future, we gather to praise you with our lips, but also with our lives. Though we're too often taken up with our own concerns, in this moment, we acknowledge that you are God, the beginning and the end of all things, our rock and our refuge, the very foundation of our lives. Lord, as we worship, stretch our mind to see the vastness of your universe, the sun and the moon and the stars, everything that reflects your beauty. Stretch our imagination to see you in the people we meet daily. Stretch our expectations to understand that you are not far from us, but that your spirit dwells and indwells and renews us in the likeness of Jesus Christ our Savior. Holy God, make us conscious in this worship service that your Spirit helps us to sing and to pray and to read and to leave this place more ready than we when we entered to walk in your ways. And Lord, we thank you that our prayers are taken by our Lord Jesus Christ, our great High Priest, and are presented to you and before your throne. Gracious God, whom to know is life eternal, whom to serve is joy and peace, hear us now as we confess our need of you. You're the great Creator, we are the created. You are holy, we are not. You are a God of purpose, but we often find ourselves pulled in all directions. O oh Lord, forgive our unfocused lives. Forgive the opportunities for good that we waste and the trivialities we often choose instead. Help us to find in Jesus the way to live life well and to look to him both for the pardon we need and the purpose we need. Faithful God, walk with us into this new week so that we consciously live in your power and in your presence. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Bible reassures us over and over of God's pardon that God offers to us. And one verse of the Bible says this, the proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Trust that that dying and undying love offers you God's pardon and peace this day. Amen. This being uh, as close to Canada Day as we can get, uh, we're delighted. I'm delighted at the flags flying outside on the way in. And I wonder where they came from. <laughs> but I think we could probably locate the provider of those in Paul Hicks. He thinks of everything. Flowers inside, <laughs> flags outside. <laughs> but inside, uh, we, I thought it'd be lovely to have another, someone speak about Canada in appreciation, and I've invited Beth Allen to do just that. So, come on, Beth. <laughs> Happy Canada Day weekend, everyone. This is going to be very short. 
With an Irish and German background, whose ancestors were brave enough to emigrate to Canada in the late 1700s, we as youngsters were taught to be proud Canadians in this chosen land. Reflecting on my childhood, I recall running and playing with my seven siblings on our 140-acre farm and also working on it. I was about to say a hobby farm, but in reality, it was probably a necessity, feeding eight children and giving us chores to keep us busy and out of trouble. My dad was a building contractor, so he wasn't doing much farming. I felt, and my siblings did, that Canada was the world. As I got older and horizons broadened, fortunately, my feelings did not change. How wonderful to be graciously received when traveling abroad. Oh, you're Canadian. Welcome. Let me boast a bit about a few things. How fortunate are we to live in a country of such cultural diversity? From those indigenous to this land, to those who have been here for generations, years, months, or weeks. Diversity makes us strong. A country of freedom. Freedom to speak without fear. Freedom to worship regardless of our faith. Freedom to oppose what we believe is wrong. Freedom to vote for our governmental leaders. A country of opportunity. Anyone willing to put in some hard work can succeed. And a country of such varied topography. Our oceans, rivers, lakes, and streams. Our mountains, our prairies, our farmlands, our cities, towns, and villages our national parks. I could go on, but I think you know that I am a fan. Thankfully, once a year, on July 1st, we have a national holiday to help us to take time to celebrate our home. We are and should be Canada proud. As we move forward, let us strive to build a better future knowing that we can't change history, but we can help to prevent further historic wrongs. We've come a long way, and we have a long way to go. Best wishes on this Canada Day weekend to you and your loved ones. Happy 156th birthday, Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Beth, uh, for a very thoughtful reflection, indeed. I wouldn't have expected any less because you are that a wonderful, a wonderful Canadian. So thank you very much. We ha all have an opportunity to uh, pray for our country as we sing the national anthem. So I'm going to invite you to stand and uh, sing the national anthem. <laughs>
Let us pray. Holy God, Word made flesh, let us come to your Holy Word open to being surprised. <clears throat> Silence our agendas, banish our assumptions, cast out our casual detachment, confound our expectations, focus our entire beings on you, your grace, your mercy, your righteousness. Penetrate the corners of our hearts with this word. We believe that you can. We pray that you will, and we await with great expectation. Amen. The Old Testament reading this morning is taken from 1 Kings chapter 3. It's on page 238 in your pew Bible. <clears throat> Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because a temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me, and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke, and he realized it had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem, stood before the ark of the Lord's covenant, 
and sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then he gave a feast for all his court. Now, two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. One of them said, pardon me, my lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I had a baby while she was there with me. The third day after my child was born, this woman also had a baby. We were alone. There was no one in the house but the two of us. During the night, this woman's son died because she lay on him. So she got up in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while I, your servant, was asleep. She put him by her breast and put her dead son by my breast. The next morning, I got up to nurse my son, and he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning light, I saw it wasn't the son I had born. The other woman said, no, the living one is my son, the dead one is yours. But the first one insisted, no, the dead one is yours, the living one is mine. And so they argued before the king. The king said, this one says my son is alive and your son is dead. Well, the other one says, no, your son is dead and mine is alive. Then the king said, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword for the king. He then gave an order, cut the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive was deeply moved out of love for her son and said to the king, Please, my lord, give her the living baby. Don't kill him. But the other said, Neither you nor I shall have him. Cut him in two. Then the king gave his ruling. Give the living baby to the first woman. Do not kill him. She is his mother. When all Israel heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. The New Testament reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 to 45, on page uh, 716 in your pew Bible. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You do not know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink? or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. I'm sorry, the printer seems to be. It's embarrassing. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, 
and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. because I'm retired that I think about this and since quite a few of you are retired perhaps you think the same way that is do you ever reflect on the course of your life and think about the choices you made or didn't made didn't make and think about the person you ended up becoming it can be quite frightening to do that I think at least for me what if you chose what if you chosen to go to a different school or university? What if you'd pursued a different career, a different job? What if you'd married a different person? Have you ever thought about that one? Don't answer that question. <laughs> but the thing is it isn't just it isn't just the big choices that form our character. It's also, maybe even more so, the small daily choices we each make. What I eat, how I choose to spend my money, whether or not I choose to hold a grudge against someone, all of those sorts of choices and hundreds of other daily ones end up shaping the sort of person I've become. With character formation in mind, I want to turn back and look again at Solomon as he's presented to us here in 1 Kings chapter 3. Just to recap quickly, 1 Kings chapter 1, which we looked at a couple of weeks ago, introduced Solomon as King David's son and successor. And in that chapter, we noted the intrigue that accompanied his accession to the throne. Last Sunday we read 1 Kings chapter 2, 
which focused on how Solomon had his political enemies killed, posing the question, is it legitimate for the state, and he represented the state, to punish its enemies? Well, today in 1 Kings chapter 3, we peek behind Solomon's public life somewhat to discover something of his personal choices. And one of those choices was his decision to marry the daughter of Egypt's Pharaoh. That's the very first thing we read in 1 Kings chapter 3. Verse 1 of Kings, 1 Kings 3 indicates that, by the way, that Solomon's choice of a bride was very much part of a larger political alliance between Israel's king, Solomon, and Egypt's king, Pharaoh. That has not been unknown throughout generation after generation of leaders and kings and emperors. They marry for political as well as personal reasons. Now, there was no Jewish law at the time that forbade Solomon from marrying a non-believing person from an alien country. Nor does 1 Kings chapter 3 right here comment on this foreign marriage. But as we'll discover in a few weeks' time, 1 King does later trace Solomon's ultimate failure as king to the influence of the multiple wives, foreign wives, that he married, who shared neither his faith nor his values. Though it's not commented on here in 1 Kings chapter 3, we're meant to take note that the process that eventually came about began when he married Pharaoh's daughter. Now, I'm not clearly in a position to pontificate as to what makes for a good marriage. But this I know, this you know, and this First Kings knows, that the person you marry will significantly shape your character. That's why parents invested in the development, the good development of their children's character, take particular notice of who their friends are. That's why parents get quite anxious when their children grow up and begin to date. Who is he? Who is she? What are they really about? Character. Sadly, some people marry with very little attention paid to the character of the person they marry. Some men simply want a trophy wife to show off. Some women want a man with wealth. Has he got a good checkbook? Such people ignore the character flaws of those to whom they pledge themselves. Well, Solomon too, it seems, chose his wife simply to secure that political alliance with Egypt. And First Kings will go on to indicate that she and his other foreign wives drew him away from God. That still happens. We've all been party to watching a couples which maybe shared lots of wonderful things together, but they didn't share a common faith. And very often the person in the marriage with faith drifts away from God. I'm quite conscious of the fact that several of my clergy colleagues are married to a spouse who does not share their faith and has little interest in their ministry. Marriage, at the best of times, I'm told, is challenging. But how much more so if husband and wife do not rely on or relate to the same God? 
It was that issue that led the Apostle Paul much later to write to the church in Corinth to tell its members, he said to them in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Now, Paul wasn't telling those Christians, don't be friends with non-Christians. He wasn't saying that at all. After all, some of the most lovely people we'll ever meet aren't Christians. And some of the most miserable people we'll meet are. It's good to mix with other people and all sorts of people. And yet, Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 6, he advises the Corinth Christians to marry fellow Christians. A person who will help them and not hinder them from becoming not only better people, but better Christians. Paul's concern was character formation. That said, the negative impact of Solomon's non-Jewish wives on his character wasn't immediate. Because 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 3 here says, at this stage of his life, after at his, the time of his first marriage, It says positively that at this stage of his life, Solomon loved the Lord and walked according to the statutes of his father David. Verse 3. For some years at least, his father's faithfulness to God influenced Solomon's character more than his wife's. So what did loving God mean for Solomon? That's an important line as to his character here in 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon loved the Lord. What's that mean? Some Christians think of loving God as a largely emotional experience that may have begun with an emotional conversion. But verse 3's note here that Solomon loved God doesn't refer to his emotions but to his ethics. That is, he showed his love for God, says verse 3, by walking according to God's law. And that's precisely what Jesus later told his own disciples to do. If you love me, what does that mean for you? If you love me, you will obey my commandments. It's when we're ready Not just to have an emotional experience, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's when we're ready to sacrifice our own desires in order to obey God, that love for God is totally real. And so it was with Solomon, as he obeyed God in the daily choices of his life. And his character was being formed. So, What choices do we make daily? What are we really about? Together, we're here in worship. And if we are regular in worship, that very pattern has the power to form in us character, Christian character, in every one of us, and to form us into a Christian community. But if worship forms Christian character, so also does the daily decision-making, the sort of daily decision-making that that brings God into every aspect of our lives. That's always a challenge, isn't it? It's it's relatively easy to be sort of God-directed on Sunday mornings, but not as easy on Thursday afternoon. Well, I just chose Thursday afternoon. It could be Friday evening or whatever. But that's how Solomon appears in 1 Kings 3. He's presented as enjoying a close and real relationship with God. He's presented as having the sensitivity to hear God speak to him, even in the middle of the night. And so we're told here that one night in a dream, God heard, sorry, Solomon heard God speak to him. God is free. God is free, and God is also eager to speak to all of us, and will use any number of ways to do so. God sometimes speaks to us in the sheer beauty of nature. We all know that. God sometimes speaks to us in the agony of pain. 
God sometimes speaks to us in the words of a song or even a sermon. God sometimes speaks to us in the faces of the poor. What we need, however, is the sensitivity that Solomon clearly had to hear God speak when he speaks. And what Solomon, in a close relationship with God, heard God say to him was this, ask for whatever you want me to give you. That's what he heard. Ask for whatever you want me to give you. And you may recall that that's very similar to how Jesus once told his disciples, remember, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened up to you. God apparently wants us to live close to him and to ask for whatever we want God to give us. That opening God gave to Solomon to ask for whatever he wanted, that opening which Jesus offers us too sounds so good, so generous, so open-ended. It could be downright self-indulgent, couldn't it? Except that the invitation has within it a sort of hidden test. Because, of course, what we end up asking God for, what we most want and ask of God, will reveal our character. What do you ask for? I want a long life. I want more money. I want, you know, we have a whole list of things. Is it more power we want? Perhaps, and this is very true of clergy, is it more opportunities to outshine someone else? What we ask, end up asking God for reveals our character. Let me give you a famous example. Before his conversion, the great St. Augustine, who eventually became a bishop and a great theologian, before his conversion, he was a wild playboy. That's exactly who he was. But then he heard God speak to him and tell him to turn his life around. Augustine's response, which he wrote up in his famous confessions, was this, O oh, Master, make me chaste, but not yet. But not yet. His, what he asked for, revealed his yet-to-be-disciplined character. Solomon, in response to God's invitation, his response was very different. He said to God, and this is found in verses 6 to 9, You've shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, given him a son to sit on the throne. Now, O Lord my God, give your servant, give me, he said, a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. Now, you know what was going to follow. That response ple pleased God. That was the, he revealed his character in that moment, what he asked for. Solomon requested wisdom to help him make good judgments. He requested wisdom to help him serve others as a good king. He requested wisdom that was more than simply worldly tact or prudence. Wisdom in the Bible, which is, I think, what we all need, isn't about being a clever know-it-all. It's about having the wisdom to lovingly obey God and live in compassion and justice with others. To illustrate what that wisdom that, that Solomon asked for and God gave, to illustrate it, 1 Kings 3 then goes on to tell us this incredible story about two mothers, one of whose newborn sons died. Wisely, Solomon, the great king, wisely, Solomon, the great ultimate judge in Israel, listened to their story. And the text emphasizes his listening. He listened to the two mothers 
each of them claiming to be the mother of the baby that survived. Each of them, by the way, says our text, a prostitute. Which makes Solomon's listening even more acute. He listens to do prostitutes, economically and morally sideline rejects, but he listened. And Solomon not only listened, but discerned the truth and delivered justice. Have you noticed, very often in our society, it was one kind of justice for the rich and another for the poor, but not with Solomon and not with God. As king and as judge, Solomon used wisdom to help those women who had nothing and could give him nothing. First Kings 3, again as we've discovered in the first two chapters, is realistic. That is, Solomon is presented not as a perfect man. And yet, that chapter shows us him making choices and revealing his character and his character, his godly character growing. In essence, and this is one of his big choices, in essence, Solomon had to choose between two ways of being king. He could either be a tyrant who used his power and position to lord it over everyone else, or he could be a servant king who used his power and position to enhance the well-being of his people. He chose the latter. That's what 1 Kings 3 reveals. He chose the latter. He chose to serve others and to discern the needs of others, particularly these, between these two women. And in doing so, Jesus of, or Solomon, of course, paved the way for the great, great servant king, Jesus, who, as we discovered in Mark chapter 10, earlier read, gave his life. He gave his life, says Mark 10, as a ransom for many. So, how are we doing with our choices and our character? First Kings 3 and Mark 10 both ask us to ponder that question. It's the same question that Jesus posed to James and John, his, two of his great dis disciples, when they came asking for special privileges and special power, thus revealing their self-seeking character. Well, Jesus took them aside and brought in the other ten disciples and said, look, folks, what you're asking for reveals how the world operates. I want position, I want power, I want privilege. It's not to be so among you. Whoever wants to be great among you, said Jesus, must be your servant. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. So, we want to be wise, discerning Christians. That's what Solomon asked for, and what God gave him, and what pleased God. We want to be the same. To be wise Christians does not mean that we are, we know everything. I mean, some Christians act like that, but that's not what wisdom means in the Bible. Nor does to be wise mean that every one of us is hugely gifted. Nor does it mean that every one of us is super spiritual. The last thing Canada needs is arrogant Christians who think they know everything. That's not what we need. We need to be ourselves and we need our leaders in our country, our politicians, our pastor and our people. We need people who are developing the sort of character that will help, help them to live lives of self-forgetful service and give themselves away for the good of others, as did Solomon. To develop that character, we make it a habit 
to gather weekly for worship. And that's good. We need to do that. We need to turn to Jesus, to listen to Jesus, to learn from Jesus, and to allow Jesus to rule our lives. But then we also need to make daily decisions that are in line with Jesus. We need to make daily decisions that are related to God. If Solomon could do it, if Solomon could do it, so could we. Amen. As the choir sings, your offering will be taken.
Eucharist, we offer you our gifts and pray for the power to offer and present our very selves to you. A living sacrifice, dedicated and fit for your acceptance. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. prayer of thanksgiving and supplication. God of wisdom, giver of all good things, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your correction, your compassion, your comfort, and your care. We bless you for the gift of life and for your guiding hand upon us and your sustaining love within us. We thank you for friendship and duty, for hopes and precious memories, and for the joys that cheer us day by day. And we thank you even for the trials that teach us to trust in you. We thank you today for our country, its opportunities and its resources, its diverse people and traditions of justice and welcome. We thank you for Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour, for the living presence of your Spirit, for your Church, the Body of Christ, and for the ministry of word and sacraments and all the means of grace. In our weakness you are our strength, in our darkness light, in our sorrows comfort and peace. From everlasting to everlasting you are our God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And now we pray for others. Lord God, there's much to grieve you and trouble us in this world. We think of tensions between Russia and the West, and between rich nations and poor nations. <coughs> Lord, help world leaders to stand for what is right, and help wealthy nations like ours to not only generously share resources, but to ensure that economic systems are open and just for all. We pray for those communities east and west in our country that remain threatened by fire. Lord, protect them from harm and enable firefighters to work well. We pray for Canada's churches. Faithful God, this is a time of testing for all Christians. Steady our faith in the power of Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. And Lord, bless our own modest efforts here at St Andrews to commend faith in you to our neighbours, indeed doing so through our upcoming vacation Bible camp and the gatherings for Gatto and Grace. <coughs> we pray today for those who are facing tough times, those we know whose bodies are never free of pain. Those who care daily for loved ones with memory loss. Those whose sunny faith has been clouded by doubt. Those whose choices now trouble their lives. Heavenly Father, shepherd of your sheep, source of all that's good, come, we pray, to those who seek you, but Lord, also seek us out those who don't. And now, gracious God, we commit ourselves to you. Help us by your Spirit to choose to think, speak, and act in ways that will build others up rather than tear them down. And to think and to speak and to act in ways that will reflect your power at work in our lives. All this we pray through Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever.